Trump said his defense was, I'm a germaphobe. Yeah, I'm a germaphobe. I would never get peed on. But he wasn't, the claim was he not wasn't that getting he was But what could be more illicit than watching the peeing? <laughs> the peeing. Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. My name is Jody Avergan. This week we're doing things a little differently. It has been a while since we've kind of taken a step back and checked in on the state of the Russia investigation. So today we're going to spend the whole show talking about various theories about the connection between President Trump and Russia. It is 538's debate-o-rama. Debate-o-rama? Just, just debate. into that? Just the debate? But if you add a rama to the end of almost anything, it, it makes it more, more fun. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Aren't you having fun, listeners? <laughs> Before we explain exactly what we're up to, our participants, Editor-in-Chief Nate Silver. Hello, Nate. Hello, Jody. Senior politics writer Claire Malone. Hello, Claire. Hey, Jody. And politics editor Micah Cohen. Hi. And should we say that um, if you enjoy what you're about to listen to, feel free to send me a note. And if you don't enjoy it, you can send Micah a note because it was all his idea. Oh, God. <laughs> Leave us a rating. Oh, oh leave a rating. Yeah. Leave a rating. Oh, leave a rating. Uh, look, so here is what we're going to do. Again, a bit of an experiment. But in order to take stock of what we know so far and how the evidence lines up, we're going to go through four different theories about Trump and Russia, ranging on the spectrum from it's nothing all the way to it's way worse than we feared. And each person at this table has kind of studied up on one of these theories and will be making the case as evidence. So we're going to be arguing one of these cases and the others will discuss it. So let's go around and say, what each person will be arguing in one sentence and then we'll get into it. So I'm going to go first and I'm at the end of the spectrum that this is really nothing. So I will be making the case that this is all just a bunch of coincidences. Russia didn't directly help the Trump camp and there was nothing for them to collude on. Next will be Claire. I'm making theory of the case number two, which is that Russian intelligence actively penetrated the Trump campaign, but Trump didn't know. And I'm making the argument that, but Trump knew. And Nate? P tape. <laughs> A little broader than just yeah. P-tape, right? Compromat. Two words, P-tape. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm arguing for, we have a spectrum. This was put together by the folks at Lawfare, mm -hmm. a website we like a lot that does a lot of analysis of, of legal affairs and a lot of analysis of Trump and Russia. They like a seven-point spectrum where it goes from like nothing happened at all to like Trump is actually like a certified Russian agent. We're not going that far. So we're not going quite that We've far. We've condensed and collapsed a couple of those but like together. Six was compromised, I think. And yeah. Like, yeah. I'm going to be arguing for like the 5.6. So, yes, shout out to the folks at Lawfare for writing that piece and giving us a kind of framework for this. And the way it works is everyone's going to make their case. And as each person makes their case, we're not going to necessarily argue it there. You can, the others can ask questions and even chime in to help buttress the argument. And then at the end, we'll kind of take stock and debate and, I don't know, pick a winner. We'll debate. Which argument is the best, yes. but also well, who made the best argument? Yes. Okay. Should we note here that Nate is a former high school debate debate champion? Were yeah. you a champion or just a participant? Oh, you, <laughs> you <laughs> bet I was a champion. <laughs> Nate, Nate was legit offended by that question. I want receipts. <laughs> you, Mr. The, Silver, if you're we, listening, I would like the to trophy? see Nate's trophy. Oh, there are so many trophies. Don't encourage. My mom's listening to the podcast. Uh, Don't encourage her. Send us some pictures, Send us some please. pictures, yes. please, Mrs. Silver. Um, okay, so let's get into it, and I'm going to start uh, with theory number one, which is that this is all a bunch of coincidences. Russia didn't directly help the Trump camp, and there was nothing for Trump or his campaign to know about. And I will point out, you know— Ready, Jody? Oh, is there, so you're putting me on the clock? Begin. Wait. <laughs> Wait, how long do we have? No, we have we have a reasonable amount of time. No, Don't be a I like this. It. Let's time it. Why well, didn't time mine out in advance? Oh, you practice yours? <laughs> Is that a metronome? That's a gavel. It's a gavel. <laughs> okay, here we go. So look, folks, I will concede right off the bat that Donald Trump is an incredibly divisive figure who has poisoned our politics, revealed and catered some of the worst parts of America. But he did all of this on his own. He did not need Russian help. There's this element of anti-Trump hysteria sweeping across our country right now, bringing primarily from the simple fact that people can't accept that he became president. And that hysteria is blinding us and causing us to become conspiracy minded, to see connections, especially Russia related connections, where they simply don't exist. We've seen narrow electoral college coalitions in this country before. We've seen people lose the popular vote and win the presidency before. So why not Trump? This is not to say that the Trump campaign didn't touch on Russia. Of course, Trump had an opinion on Russian relations. Maybe he wanted to improve them for business reasons or maybe he just really likes strongmen like Vladimir Putin. But the stuff he said about Russia was just that, stuff he said about Russia. It was just talk. So it's no surprise that Putin, as 
especially when Hillary Clinton was Trump's opponent, would say that he wanted Trump to win or that the Trump campaign would attract folks like Manafort and Flynn, who had ties to the region. But a lot of these folks were hangers on. The Trump campaign was a shoddy operation. You may have noticed these folks did not have real influence. It's only in retrospect through a Russian paranoid lens that people start to see connections when there is only coincidence. As my good friends Julian Assange and Glenn Greenwald have argued – no, I'm joking. That part's just <laughs> – <laughs> um, That's my argument. Wait. So boil it down. Your argument is basically anti-Trump hysteria has, has caused us to see – Connect dots. Connect dots when they really aren't there. There were pro-Russia hangers-on floating around the Trump campaign, but that is so far from actual collusion. So one argument I saw in favor of this that I found pretty convincing was that if you are a – operative in in Republican world and you have Russia sympathies, Trump world was basically your only option, right? And so it kind of naturally attracted those people who had the genuinely had those sympathies or maybe, you know, had those sympathies for monetary reasons, right? But that that's what attracted those Russo files and the Flins and the the pages. And that's plausible. Yeah, I also think that you know, I, I'm well, going to say something Nate. which I'm 90% sure will get edited out. <laughs> P-tape. Some of this reminds me of uh, there was an old Onion article entitled "Why Do All These Homosexuals Keep Sucking My Blank?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I do one. It sometimes feels like oh, all these people happen to be in bed with the Republican government, kind of literally or figuratively, just so happen to like kind of yeah. gravitate toward the Trump campaign. I mean, I mean, maybe. Well, certainly with Hillary Clinton as the opponent, I mean, you kind of got this this poll over here of a uh, Putin hated Hillary Clinton, and so you would understand that the gravity would move. You know, I think in a, in another election, in perhaps there would be like pro Russia folks who would be more diffused across both sides. But this was such a, you know, Trump was such a like force of gravity for these folks. I am slightly this was a little hard to to argue, I will admit, but I'm slightly sympathetic to just cautioning against this conspiratorial thinking. And there's a wide spectrum of conspiratorial thinking, as I'm sure we will address as we go. And so I think it is imp- it is helpful to just say, like, how many of these dots only connect in retrospect? So how do you, into your argument, account for Trump's repeated lies about and, and Trump world's repeated lies about meetings with the Russian ambassador, you know, knowledge of meetings with Russian figures, et cetera. So in the world of me making this argument, Trump lies about everything. You could pick any country and follow that thread and be like, oh, there's a conspiracy about Venezuela or there's a conspiracy about Greece. And you would probably find seven things, (laughs) seven lies that Trump has made has made and just sort of said random stuff in front of a microphone because he's constantly lying, constantly spinning, constantly talking about the people he's met with. And so Again, you know, you pull, you sweep all the dots together from Russia, and then you have a theory of the case. But it's uh, this is just the way Trump acts. I mean, to me, like you're arguing to have like a prior that is skeptical about what's found on Russia, and I might agree with that prior. Yeah, I think in general, journalists began in a very skeptical position about Russia. We can debate the reasons why for that, right? And so, kind of at first, it did seem like. A lot of the people doing the theorizing were either like a little bit partisan or a little bit kooky. What I'm saying, though, is that we have moved far enough based on actual evidence where whatever prior we have should have been adjusted Mm -hmm. significantly, right? You have the president's former attorney now saying the president was aware of and authorized a meeting with the Russians to gather dirt on Hillary Clinton, and Trump's deflecting him by saying, no, 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 no. It wasn't me. It was only my son, you know, and everyone else in the campaign. Only they were doing it, you know. So it's like the floor at this point has to be fairly high. And also, if you are like a, one of those types who um, was very skeptical to begin with, then then have you lost credibility at this point? Weren't you one of those types? I wasn't one of those Greenwaldian types. Okay, anything else on this theory or should we keep going down our spectrum and then we can loop back and talk about some of the other stuff? Let's keep going. Okay, Claire, you are up. So tell us what you're arguing and make your case. Hey, guys. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm making the case, which I think is actually the the, the quite reasonable case, which is that Russian Mm. intelligence actively penetrated the Trump campaign, but that Trump didn't know. And I think we need to take a couple of things here, which is let's cut through the partisan framework 
and we know of our of our 2018 moment. And let's look back to 2016 when we know that Donald Trump was a highly inexperienced candidate. A lot of people thought he ran on a lark and then it sort of spiraled into something real. And as a result, his campaign attracted poor personnel. You know, Republicans wanted to be nowhere. Respectable Republicans wanted to be nowhere near that campaign. And I think we also know another thing with hindsight is our advantage, which is that the Russians did not want Hillary Clinton to win that election. And they had a concentrated foreign policy objective to say, let's try to let's try to like influence this election a little bit. And so the Russians took advantage of the Trump campaign's poor personnel and they influenced people around Trump. So you've got Manafort, you've got Flynn taking meetings, you've got the Carter pages of the world. And the Russians, because they were, you know, doing a concentrated effort, got into the campaign, did make those contacts, did place the right people or talk to the right people. But let's like let's let's cut to the chase and say that Trump had no idea what was going on because why would he? He doesn't read briefings. He rarely actually emails. We don't know how much he was involved with some of these, you know, hearing about some of these meetings. And even if he did hear about them, can we honestly be sure that he would know that a lot of these people were agents of a foreign government? I, I don't think we can say that. I don't think we can say that Trump was a savvy enough actor. And so I think, you know, right now in 2018, we're living in an incredibly conspiratorial time. And we are right in one way, which is that, yes, the Russians were conspiring against the United States government. But I think we've lost a little bit of sight in, our, you know, seeing the world through our partisan lenses. But Trump is not savvy enough to be a dupe of the Russian government. He is simply an incompetent actor whose campaign became, in a terrible way, a vehicle for a foreign government. But he himself is, you know, while he might be a person who has acted criminally in other ways, I don't think and I do not think we have the evidence for the fact that he was aware of Russians helping him in his campaign. Hmm. <laughs> That's convincing. Although I'm about to blow it apart with my argument. <laughs> Claire, can I ask Try you, it. <laughs> Claire, can I ask you a question about this argument? Is this the argument on our spectrum that um, kind of most centers Putin as like super spy puppet master who's just really got everyone doing exactly what he wants, even Not if they all. don't know? Not at all. Not at all. I think that we, in the again, in the past two years, have oversold the sophistication of the Russian, Russian campaign. It's in fact quite blunt and in some ways childish. I mean, you know, a lot of their attempts at compromising people or getting them to, you know, get the dirt were, were quite clumsy. I think that the Russians are sophisticated in one way, which is they know how to exploit our sort of bravado about our democracy. And they know that the way we will fall hardest is if we, ex they ex you know, exploit um, people's faith in that. But their ultimate objective. But you don't think Trump knew, even though Michael Cohen says he knew. Michael Cohen is an incredibly unreliable character. If I were, you know, in a court of law and I were his lawyer, I'd be incredibly worried about his credibility. He's lied let in the past. Let Nate, me tell you. Wait, 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 let me finish this point. He's lied in the past. He has had a series of dubious business dealings. Michael Cohen is not a reputable character, and he is also worried about imprisonment. So, yeah, he's sort of going to say let me put this in. If the Cleveland Browns, hmm. who are a bad Oh, thanks NFL for talking team. to me in the way <laughs> I understand. <laughs> it's a deliberately chosen analogy. If they were to play a team made up of employees and staff of 538 at football, then who would win? What's the analogy here? What are you talking <laughs> the about? The analogy <laughs> is that Cohen might be unreliable, but like Trump is an even less reliable support. That's the analogy. You won okay. debate medals I was trying to wait, this kind of stuff. Okay. <laughs> it's been, I'm, I'm rusty. Okay. <laughs> Claire, you got him on the ropes, Claire. There, but, there, uh, but there are other people too. I mean, Steve Bannon. How plausible is it that Don and Don Jr. didn't talk? There are phone calls that are redacted between Trump I think Jr. Don and Trump. Jr. Uh, is a loyal son who wanted to protect his father. I do believe the fact that Trump didn't know about those meetings. So and it, I think Steve Bannon's comments in the media, Steve Bannon loves being in the media and he loves speculating on things. He's another person who's not a particularly reliable witness, which Don, I think is... Don the, Jr. loves speculating about stuff and he loves to like draw favorable attention to the bond between him and his dad. And like, You don't think Don Jr. had a moment where... like. He pulled President Trump aside, or candidate Trump at that point, and was like, uh, hey, Dad. I'm doing this thing. These nice people. That's to have very speculative. If that's your best evidence for Trump new, that's very speculative. I'm not saying it's the best evidence. I'm <laughs> saying, like, it's common sense. 
Like, first of all, why are we all using like a like a legal standard? Why is here? it common sense that he would clue his father into a meeting that he knew was maybe legally dubious? A loyal son would not do that. Because I th- don't know Don Jr., but he seems like someone who's certainly eager to please. Seems. But if you're eager to please... There are also like three of his other top advisors in this meeting, and Trump actually, the day this meeting occurs, says, oh, there's going to be some... Or the day before, is like, there's going to be some great stuff on Hillary Clinton stealing my evidence coming out again. soon. No. Okay. Um, okay. So I don't know how often... Maybe we should put ourselves under like a 45 second clock to interject and say we are all making a predetermined. We are all, we are playing a role here and making an argument that we've been determined. I don't want anyone. Did like, we say that at the top? We did yeah. say that at the top. It's probably worth reiterating. As people we go. are dumb enough to think that. <laughs> I think Nate forgot. <laughs> yeah, Nate may have forgot. <laughs> um, so Claire, let me ask you one last question on this, and then we and then we should move on. But you used that phrase "unwitting dupe" for Donald Trump, and I think that that kind of is is the really interesting place here, which is ultimately. Are we judging this, and I guess is Mueller judging this, on actions or intentions? I mean, a lot of the law comes down to that. But why do you feel like it's important to point out the kind of like unwitting nature of it, even if the behavior may have crossed some legal standard? Well, we don't have a legal standard for what collusion is. So that's actually quite a fuzzy argument. But I do think intent is important with with criminal cases. And I don't think Trump has – I don't see any evidence beyond a reasonable doubt um, and that's an incredibly important thing, that Trump has done anything that would make him an agent of a foreign government in some way that is at least a little bit conscious. I think he is someone who has a sense of politics that is dirty in the tradition. You know, it is far from the traditional norms that we have adhered to in American politics. But I'm not sure. It almost seems like he's, you know, a guy who's committing white collar crimes but like kind of walked into it a little bit like he wasn't quite sure he was doing it but his moral spectrum is skewed in the immoral direction more so than most people and i think it's been cultivated by years in the real estate industry which i think is an industry that exists in the shades of gray and in the liminal spaces of legality and uh i think that trump does not have a good sense of what is moral or what is legal I was listening to an episode of uh, The Weeds from our friends at Vox, and they were talking about something interesting, which is that I think Matt Iglesias was making this point that, you know, people's motivations are super complicated. And to one person, you know, acting, you know, being someone else's dupe or being someone else's puppet is to another person, it's just kind of oh, I like this person. I'm kind of helping out a friend or I'm sympathetic to their interests or they've always looked out for me. So I think it's worth keeping in mind that people's motivations are really complicated and and rarely is it the case where someone has a very clean, clear-cut motivation. But in terms of Trump's foreign policy outcomes, those are fairly favorable for Russia. So don't bother to guess the motivation. Just say, look, he has weakened our relationship with our NATO allies with Canada and Mexico, strengthened our relationship with some authoritarian regimes, right? It's a new balance of power. You know, we've been hawkish toward China. All those things, I think, are things that Russia would want, where there's like a geopolitical rebalancing a little bit, where in some ways the United States is becoming more isolated, more real politic. NATO is weakened, certainly. The notion of kind of the West, either meaning The Americas or the U.S. plus Europe has been weakened a bit. I mean, you know, Russia has to be reasonably happy with with these outcomes. I I agree with that. And I, in fact, that's another part of my argument that you've now stolen. But there are other ways to explain (laughs) that, too. Uh, Okay, Claire, a final thought here. Should we break and move on? No, I think I've done an excellent job of laying out my theory. Yeah, yeah, nice work. Micah, you're up next. You want to tease what you're going to do, and then we're going to we have to take a break. I'm going to show that the Russia's interference in the election should have been on Trump's radar and that he has behaved as if it was. All right, we'll do that in a minute. But first, let me tell you that today's podcast is brought to you by Lightstream. If you're thinking about saving money this summer, why not start by paying less interest on your credit card balances? Refinance with a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. It's an easy way to save hundreds to thousands of dollars and lower your interest rate. Lightstream offers credit card consolidation loans from 5.89% APR with auto pay, lower than your average credit card interest rate, which is now over 18% 
APR. The average credit card interest rate is over 18%. You could get your funds as soon as the day you apply. Lightstream believes that people with good credit deserve a great interest rate and no fees. Say goodbye to high interest credit cards this summer and start saving with Lightstream. Right now, you can save even more with an additional interest rate discount on top of Lightstream's already low rates. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash 538 Lightstream, L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M. I don't know if that was any easier. Lightstream, you know how to spell it. Lightstream.com slash 538. Subject to credit approval. Rate includes 0.5% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit Lightstream.com for more information. Today's podcast is also brought to you by Casper Mattresses. It's the middle of the night and you're tossing and turning, not sleeping, drenched, covered in sweat, perhaps thinking about the upcoming midterms. You could run the AC or a fan all night to try and keep cool, or you could get rid of your heat-trapping mattress and sleep as cool as the other side of the pillow with a Casper mattress. All Casper mattresses use premium foams that relieve pressure and help align your body so you fall asleep feeling comfortable and wake up feeling refreshed. Thanks to the breathable material, you're guaranteed to sleep cool all summer long. It ships for free in a box so small you won't believe it holds a mattress. But folks don't always believe what you think you believe because there is indeed a mattress inside that small box. Why do they ship it in a box that small? Well, for one, so you can try it risk-free for 100 nights in your own home. Just get it shipped. Take it up to your room, unfurl it, try it out, and if you don't love your Casper, they'll come pick it up and refund you everything, no questions asked. Sleep cool and comfortable every night. Get a Casper. Try yours for 100 nights with free shipping and returns. Go to casper.com slash politics and use the promo code politics for 50 bucks off. That's casper.com slash politics. The code is politics. Casper.com terms and conditions apply. All right, we're back. Micah told you the argument he's going to make. Now let's hear it. Dive in. All right. So it's a two-parter. One is, contrary to what my dear friend Claire Malone said a little bit ago, Russia and Russia interference in the election did not become a big story in the media only after the 2016 election. It was a big story throughout. In other words, there are a ton of reasons that Trump should have been thinking about Russia. So one, if you remember, Trump's coziness with Putin became a big story all the way back in 2015. Remember that interview he gave with Morning Joe, remember Putin complimented Trump and Trump like was all happy about it. In December of 2015, there were already questions about Michael Flynn's work with Russia Today, which is sort of the quasi Russian government backed media outlet. So in other words, there were just there were all these strands in the air so that if you were a presidential candidate, it wasn't like Russia was back of mind. Russia was front of mind for much of the 2016 campaign. So much front of mind that you had that Carter Page surveillance start during it, right? You had Trump staffers engineer that change in the GOP platform, Mm re-Ukraine, right? All this stuff is stuff that naturally would rise up to the candidate, right? So that's part number one. There are tons of reasons Trump should have been thinking about Russia. Part number two is we have a lot of evidence from Trump himself that he was thinking about Russia. All the way back in 2014 at the CPAC conference, the Conservative Political Action Committee conference, Trump describes his time in Moscow for the Miss Universe pageant. And he says, quote, Putin even sent me a a present, beautiful present with a beautiful note. I spoke to all his people. Trump routinely cited information provided by WikiLeaks and expressed his enthusiasm for Assange and what Assange was doing, right? At one point, he yelled, like, I love WikiLeaks. In an interview on this week, he called NATO obsolete. This is all before the election, remember, right? I guess my point is just, I don't think it's right to say that we're only putting these pieces together after the fact. I think any decent runner of a campaign or or candidate would have put these pieces together before the fact. Just just a couple more pieces of evidence yeah. that I, I think are, are the most compelling. One is, as Nate mentioned earlier, Trump's personal ter- attorney, Michael Cohen, now says Trump knew about that Trump Tower meeting with Russian operatives beforehand. Claire's totally right. Michael Cohen is not a reliable witness, but it's certainly a piece of evidence that carries some weight, right? Two, the night the meeting was set up before it took place, Trump told a crowd at a rally, quote, 
I'm going to give a major speech on probably Monday of next week, and we're going to be discussing all of the things that have taken place with the Clintons. I think you're going to find it very informative and very, very interesting. So this is when the meeting has been set up. It's supposed to have dirt on Clinton, right? After the meeting failed to produce the kind of like real dirt, that speech Trump had talked about didn't happen. Mm. Yeah. So like, okay, you know, it's pretty clear the line of events here. Trump knew about this meeting, was hoping for dirt, promised it. Dirt doesn't happen. The speech never happens, right? It's actually hard once you put it all together to believe Trump didn't know about this stuff. To me, the best argument is uh, if from, from Trump's side of things is, is more about semantics and, and w- what constitutes collusion. But but the idea that Trump wasn't aware of of these strains in the campaign, I think, strains credulity. I think – so to help this argument a little bit, I do think that to go back again to 2016 when – the Trump campaign didn't think they were going to win. Trump himself didn't think he was going to win. They were making plans to have this, you know, Trump TV network. I think Trump rightly saw the campaign as a wonderful business opportunity, a wonderful profile raising opportunity. And he has always had an eye on Russia with his business interests in mind. And I, to me, you could also you could make the argument that, like, maybe Trump knew Russia was helping, but he was perfectly fine to go along with it because he wanted to be on the good side of the Russian government for post-campaign reasons, for business reasons, essentially, and that he might have had some inkling of the Russians helping, but he thought, no harm, no foul, I'm not going to win, and let's be on good terms with Putin, whose friendship or good faith I have stroked for a while. And going back to sort of Trump's context and frame of reference, I do buy the fact that like Trump could have looked at all this stuff and thought, this isn't that nefarious or, mm-hmm. or or it's not that big a deal. It's not like Trump had run in five presidential campaigns or before. Or had people around him who would say – Right. Exa- well, I mean he had some like he people. He respects the rules for much of anything. Right. Like, exactly. Yeah. I mean to me it's like this evidence is hiding in plain sight, right? He kind of stood on a stage – and said, Russia, if you have the emails, right. you know, get the emails. I mean, like, it's like, I do sometimes feel like people, like, the better sourced something is to the point where if someone, like, literally does it, like, in front of television cameras <laughs> at a rally with thousands of people, people are like, oh, you know. No, they want secret documents. Yeah, they want, you know, a source told the Washington Post, blah, blah, Some blah. Sort of right? tape. All right, two other pieces of evidence, real quick. One is... I think you know that in high school debate you actually have a time limit on how much you can say. Well, I, well, I, I argued for a debate. time limit. <laughs> All right, one. I think Trump thinks he's guilty. Here's a tweet from Donald Trump: As has been stated by numerous legal scholars, I have the absolute right to pardon myself. But why would I do that when I have done nothing wrong? <laughs> Question mark. In the meantime, the never-ending witch hunt led by 13 very angry and conflicted Democrats and others continues into the midterms. Why would you even bring that up? Because he's a small C conservative guy and he wants to cover all his faces. <laughs> Second piece of evidence. One thing I've always been very curious about is remember when Michael Flynn got fired? Flynn he, sanity. Theoretically, he got fired for lying to Vice President Mike Pence. Mm-hmm. Why wasn't he fired for lying to President Donald Trump? Because the, he the never argument had a was convers- that Trump never had those kinds of conversations, right? Never had what kind of conversations? I mean, Trump I did the sp- fire the FBI what, what? director and told Lester Holt that it was because of the Russia thing. Of the Russia thing. So it's like, you know, if you were totally innocent, why would you behave in that way? No, right. Yeah. But also, like, are you implying with that thing that tr- that Flynn never lied to Trump because Trump was in on it? Because I think the other argument would be Flynn and Trump never had conversations where Flynn would have lied or would have brought up his contacts with that is certainly possible but I, first of all i'm not implying anything i'm just asking questions claire <laughs> it is possible that flynn never told trump that that you know he didn't dis- discuss sanctions with uh with the russian ambassador they interacted a lot you know flynn was on calls w- when or in the room when trump spoke to putin and stuff like that so i, I you know it just always seemed odd to me that Flynn was fired for misleading the vice president instead of the president. 
One thing I'll just add to maybe pick up on Nate's point too, which is I think I think you citing all the stuff that P- Trump said publicly is really key here. I mean, what's that? What's that phrase like? If someone sh- tells you who they are, believe them. You know, you just yeah. need to gather all the evidence and see that. And we've talked a lot on the, on this show. Trump is sort of a gossip, and he sort of lives his day to day out loud, whether it's on Twitter or telling talking to the media. So, like, if he's saying this stuff, we should believe it. Okay, final contestant. Compromat. Compromat with a K. I'm claiming that Trump fears that there could be personal repercussions unless he kind of does Putin's bidding. Bidding. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was watching that press conference in Helsinki, which is one of those moments I think actually does like, what was it, like three whole weeks ago now or something, right? I do think it kind of survives a little bit the test of time in terms of being a significant news event and also just a strange news event where to see a president, particularly a president who hates to be shown up, hates to seem like the small man on stage, just a very deferential, acquiescent kind of small nature of Trump to Putin at the Helsinki press conference. I mean, I was going to, I was being whether to play like the poker card, right? But, you know, I used to play poker and you're trying to read people. And yeah, some players try and conceal their behavior. So they're acting strong when they're actually weak. But a lot of players are very emotive, and a lot of times it's perfectly obvious how people are feeling. And it seemed like Trump wasn't even, like, bothering to conceal that he felt some degree of fear or felt enthrall in some way to Putin. But anyway, I was kind of looking at that conference and thinking, you know what? Because it wasn't even like Trump at the conference was saying, look, if you knew, for example, that Russia had a P-tape, then maybe Trump would try and act really tough on Putin in that press conference and they'd kind of choreograph something But what if Trump doesn't know what they have exactly? This is kind of the theory I'm heavily borrowing from Adam Davidson in The New Yorker, who had an article called A Theory of Trump Compromat. And kind of the very moment I was like kind of thinking about this after the press conference, like he published this article. But the notion is like, isn't it scarier in some ways if, number one, you've done enough bad shit in Russia where certainly some of the stuff being disclosed could be damaging to you. Maybe there's some sex stuff. We know that Trump, although on the one hand, isn't easily embarrassed by his sexual escapades. On the other hand, he is paying off people with whom he had consensual affairs in the United States and seems to be afraid of that, right? But probably more in the realm of like of business dealings, more in the realms of dealings of his advisors. It sounds a little strict, but also more in the realm of things that could prove and demonstrate that There have been some effort by Trump to collude. And what if Putin and other people he interacts with in Russia are able to drop enough hints to Trump that, hey, look, you know, don't get too far out of line because you never know what we know about someone. And in some ways, like the actual kind of secret itself and the uncertainty of it is maybe worse than actually knowing that they have something necessary. That's kind of where I land, right? It's like I think Trump very probably knew this was going on during the campaign. And I think, like, again, we shouldn't be applying, like, a standard of legal proof where it's, like, I mean, you know, 100% in theory. It should be, like, what does the prevailing balance of the evidence say? What does kind of the Occam's razor interpretation say? Where what's the, you know, in some ways, to say that Trump, at the very least, had awareness of what going is going on is, like, actually a much simpler explanation for everything than to say that it was all kind of a coincidence and that people, you know, Trump campaign, which is not very careful about every much of anything, all of a sudden was able to conceal it from him, even though he kind of actively and publicly encouraged Russia to do it. I mean, you know, the other big plank, I guess, in my argument, and again, I'm not like a kind of hard compromise guy. I'm kind of like halfway between Trump definitely knew compromise saying, I think Trump is fearful that Russia has compromising information on him. They probably have something, whether it's the P tape or not. I don't know. Right. But I do say there's also someone who I think was a little bit skeptical of where the Russia stuff, quote unquote, was going. And so I look at how much the goalposts have moved from just, oh, Trump was a little friendly with Russia. That was kind of weird to number one. How many indictments is now 32 people, including five U.S. nationals, 26 Russian nationals and one Dutch national have now been indicted in this investigation. It has been strongly argued that Russia was actively interfering in the election. Putin himself has admitted had admitted that he wanted Trump um, and not Hillary Clinton to win. You know, and again, meanwhile, yeah, maybe Cohen isn't the most reliable 
narrator, but you do have it's no longer even like being really disputed by the Trump campaign anymore, the White House anymore, that there was this meeting taking place at Trump Tower between, at the very least, the president's son and people who claim to have compromising information on Hillary Clinton. So that's already they're kind of admitting to collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. I would call that collusion. I mean, so it's like the floor is so would high. You, would you call that collusion? Yeah. Just taking a meeting? But you have the Don Jr. email saying, I'm really excited about what we might find out, right? They didn't just take a meeting, you know. I yeah. think they've dropped the pretense. So it's like, it's like okay. And you now see some of the most hackish, apparitionic kind of commentators now saying that, you know what? What's so bad about a little collusion, right? <laughs> or as I call it, cool illusion. It's pretty cool if, like, you're able to collude with Russia. <laughs> cool I'm sorry. That's not going to be a thing. Yeah. <laughs> cool illusion. But the threshold for what Trump has been arguing, and they've also kind of largely for a long time the argument was oh you know maybe there was obstruction but there's not collusion Mm -hmm. right it doesn't really matter if i fired comey if you can't prove collusion too but they're kind of conceding like a lot there they're conceding that there was basically obstruction we can put together the show so let's not even have a debate about obstruction because it seems pretty obvious that trump obstructed you know so it's like it's like just observing how my own Prior, which I think I'm probably somewhere in the median of like other journalists looking at the story, right? But looking at that, I you become less skeptical. I think again on this lawfare scale, it was one to seven. It seems to me like we can't be lower than like a four, and I'm arguing for like a five and a half is Mm -hmm. what I'm saying. If the floor is a four, you know, and seven is like he actually was an active Russian agent, which I don't believe that, right? But I don't know. Your entire argument centers around Trump essentially having shame about actions, right? Like that's some of what having fear. I don't think it's shame. Fear of exposure? Fear of exposure. Fear of like, he doesn't know what Putin knows. And Putin's probably very effective at using that uncertainty. I mean, it's a little bit like kind of Kafka-esque. I don't know. It's shame and fear. I mean, it's it's probably fear of something criminal. And I mean, the consensual sex things in the US, the payments seem to be shame-based or like, I don't know, fear of, I guess, the electorate finding out. The reason I have a hard time with that is like a tape came out of Trump bragging about sexual assault. So if Putin calls Trump and says, undermine NATO or I'm going to release this video of of you watching prostitutes peeing on each other, I would say release it. Trump's actions at the Helsinki conference require an explanation. I know it seems weird to put so much like – No, I agree. I agree with that. So out of character A for a U.S. president and B for Donald Trump that like – I think you have to weight that that data point a lot and say, you know, what set of circumstances leads Trump to act in that particular way? And your notion earlier, Micah, that there's uh, that people have complex motivations and they shift from time to time still fits into what Nate's arguing in that. So it may not be a specific, I'm going to release X information if you don't do Y right. thing. It's more just, hey, I've got the upper hand here. I'm going to continually kind of remind you of this and make you feel fear, as, as Nate was saying, and then Trump acts accordingly. I guess to me, so I think of all our arguments, I think the, I didn't do a good job making it, but I think the argument that Russia meddled, Trump knew about it, is sort of prima facie true based on the evidence. I, so you're voting for yourself. No, no, no. I'm saying that's the... <laughs> I, I think that's the floor. Claire just wants to know who won. No, no. I'm saying that's the floor. Yeah. That he knew. Yeah. To me, the question, and I don't think this was really captured that well, actually, in the in the lawfare scale, the question is sort of like, how did that knowledge manifest itself and what was the nature of the interactions between the Trump campaign, Trump, and those Russian operatives? I think that's what this whole thing is going to come down to mm-hmm. is what the American people think of is just holding a meeting collusion or is having a big whiteboard and sketching out the release of the WikiLeaks emails. Is that is that collusion? I think that's what this is going to come down to. That to me seems slightly separate than whether Russia like has you know the goods on Trump, isn't it? Isn't it? I think like. The f- the compromise, whether it be sexual or financial, is not something that I think people should expect. Like, yeah. I think, yeah. I, I mean, I think I keep on going back to Trump has a reputation for being both hands-on in little things 
and then also hands off on like big picture like policy stuff. And so I can't tell, I think, how much like what his exposure would be during the campaign to meetings like the the people keep on talking about, OK, there was a Don Jr. made a call to an unlisted number during that Trump Tower meeting. And a lot of people right. have pointed to, well, Trump is infamous. He has a Trump unlisted number, blah, blah, blah. Would Trump be clued in on things like that? Like, like I, I think it's I think that's sort of what we're trying to figure out is like. And based on how Trump has run his White House, I think we have to say he would be. I mean, think about how disempowered his chiefs of staff have yeah. been. Think about how how little decision making seems to take place outside of the Oval Office. Well, if you are like a pro MAGA, is it MAGA or MAGA? It's MAGA. 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 How did you get this it's far? Like <laughs> Gif and Jeff. No, no, it's not. It's, just it's MAGA. MAGA. They're both. <laughs> Wait, really? They're both with a hard G. Are you G. kidding me? <laughs> Great, Nate. Did you have a stroke? We've been saying MAGA <laughs> for like two years. But it is weird that you're saying that like that Trump was completely out of the loop on these rather important developments. Right? If you're defending the president saying he was not really in charge of his own campaign, his son was freelancing, having a meeting with all these other advisors in the middle of Trump Tower and Trump didn't know about it. I mean, that makes him seem like kind of an imbecile. But you can still make the argument that he like knew it was all going on, but was like too stupid to know that it was illegal, that it, he maybe just thought like, OK, it's that politics be, and it's all be, dirty. That might be true, right? Again, you know, I'm arguing for like there's a little half twist beyond. I mean, again, I, I I don't want to keep harping on it too much, but that conference, there are a lot of emotional states that Trump could have affected. Like one theory was that I think it was the kind of spin put out by the White House, and the spin was that Trump feels really burned by the fact that people delegitimize his election whenever they suggest that that Russia interfered and helped to make it possible, and so therefore he's indignant about that. If that were the case, he would have acted indignant in the press conference. Instead, he acted scared. Um, oh, I, I go watch I the tape. I think what well, I well, watched I in think, real time. I but think. I think the the difference is Trump could have in that press conference been indignant about people calling into question his election. Could have said, "We know that the Russians tried to interfere with our election, but despite all that, I still won. And despite blah, you know, right. whatever, I still won the election." And and that is in some ways bolstering his claims. Instead, he did something completely different, which was kowtow to the Russians, which is where I think people found it to go completely weird and awry, which is that he went a step further than he actually needed to do in sort of bowing to Putin. So we actually are running out of time. You know, we will um, obviously keep talking about this. And obviously, this is all by way of trying to get our heads around the Mueller investigation and watching that progress. And so, you know, hopefully this has been helpful on that end. But in terms of what we just did on this podcast, are we like giving ourselves grades? Are we declaring a winner? Is Micah just going to declare himself the winner? No, I'm actually very unhappy. I think I had (laughs) had the best case to make, but I think I made it very poorly. Okay. You know, in debate... Uh-huh. I don't think Nate's was that good. They have Ooh. something called. Oh, actually, Nate's was the worst. That's true. It was not the worst. <laughs> you it had, was simple. You, I didn't have to pile on. You had a softball right down the middle. You didn't. You, kinda, you didn't even really make a case. You yeah, just said, I, "This is what off. I believe in." Nate, we we base our arguments on evidence here at five thirty eight. <laughs> you got to cite some of it. <laughs> what do you mean, <laughs> Claire? Do you have a final thought here on the game we played? Not the. I think I won thirty two okay. freaking indictments. I'll okay. say Claire won too. I'll say Claire one too. I this, somewhere between Claire and Micah, you guys. I will say this exercise has made me more convinced that collusion is a real possibility mm-hmm. and that Mueller has the goods. I do think that is somewhat separate from the question of compromise. The compromise one is interesting. Though. Yeah. There's not as much evidence for that, actually. Okay. I mean, I think it's certainly possible that like <laughs> Trump was not particularly effective. I don't think anyone's arguing they're particularly effective, right? I think right. kind of Russia probably could have done most of it on their own, right? But the intent, to me, seems increasingly clear. Okay, we're going to end it there. Listeners, um, tell us what you thought about this episode on two fronts. One, sort of the format of it. Uh, maybe this is something we can continue to do. Uh, but also, just in general, where you land on this spectrum. We'll tweet out a link and maybe include a link in the show notes to the uh, Lawfare article, which we think is really useful. So shout out again to them for providing that and letting us sort of riff on it. Can I just ask that? I would be really curious from listeners to hear what you think is sort of the most compelling piece of evidence in this whole affair we have so far. What is for like, collusion? For for collusion, for oh, compromise. Okay. Just like what do you find the most kind of compelling, revealing part of this mm-hmm. piece of evidence? 
great. Uh, so you can email us, podcast at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at any of us. You can also tweet at 538politics, uh, and maybe we'll sort of touch on this stuff as we go. All right, Nate Silver, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to you, Claire Malone. Thanks, Jody. Thanks to you, Micah Cohen. Thanks. Nate, you can come back and re-record your argument if you want. <laughs> My name is Jody Avergan. Galen Jerk is our producer. Tony Chow is in the control room. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon. 